how to get set up, get something running. And then we'll go back and talk through a lot of key concepts that you should, it will help you approach Rat Pack. And then we will go through how to kind of organize your app and we'll focus a little bit on testing and then a quick touch on the fat jar and how to actually deploy that somewhere. So I'm Jeff Beck. Uh, I'm BeckJ01 on Twitter. It's the best way to get a hold of me if anyone actually would like to get a hold of me. Uh, I tend to be pretty responsive. If you have questions about Rat Pack, things like that, feel free there. Otherwise, Slack's a great place to talk as well. I'm a software architect at SmartThings, and we use uh, Rat Pack in, we're up to about 25 microservices using Rat Pack right now, and we use a number of other systems as well production experience with it uh, for about three years now we've had uh, Rat Pack in production running well. What is Rat Pack? So Rat Pack is a minimal HTTP focused framework based on Netty. It uses handlers instead of if you saw the talk yesterday that gave a brief overview between the difference between Grails and Rat Pack, there's a lot of similarities, a few differences. You can go back to that talk if you're interested. One of the key things to know about Rat Pack is it's relatively unopinionated. It will stay out of your way. You can choose to do things the way you want. Um, so that has both the positives and negatives. So in this, I'm going to give a few examples of how to organize your app, but don't feel like that's the only way. These are just recommendations about what works for me in production and a number of my teams. So we're going to actually go ahead and go and start and make an actual app. Uh, we use uh, Import that into IntelliJ, just so we can work with it a little more. So there's two ways to actually debug a Rat Pap application. Uh, you can use the standard debug JVM from Gradle, but if you're used to some other frameworks or things like that, I want to make sure I call that out. One thing to note is if you're doing the Gradle run debug JVM, uh, you can't actually get to one of the first classes that everything's defined in is here, and you can't actually debug in here if you're using the dash dash debug JVM but uh, there's a great post that will explain how to set it up in IntelliJ, and we'll just do that quick so you get a sense of what that looks like. So we're just gonna make a quick configuration that's groovy, and then we're just gonna pick the ratpack.groovy file that's created, and then name it At which point, now if we run the debugger, we get an error because I have it running in here still. Sorry. So while that starts up, yeah, I thought I killed it. 
because you're watching me. Come on. <laughs> hmm. That's weird. We'll try that again, and then promptly give up if it's not running over here, is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. It worked that time because we sufficiently waited for the demo gods. So. All right. So at this point, you will you'll be able to actually run it, use your debugger, things like that. So let's go ahead and move on to the continuous build. So the continuous build mode is a really interesting uh, feature of Gradle that you may have seen, but with Rat Pack, that's the preferred way of getting reloading to work. So if we start the, and I don't know why continuous is dash T. If anyone knows, that'd be really interesting. But dash T will give you continuous mode which means every time we make changes, so right now it's waiting for changes, if we go ahead into our project and make this render, refresh, you'll see we've got to change automatically. And you'll notice what's actually happening is the reload, rat pack starts and stops so fast, the reload mo in continuous is actually going to tear down the rat pack server and start it back up. So that works really well in most cases, unless you are using an in-memory database. And then the major difference you'll notice is that your in-memory database, like in H2, will keep getting uh, terminated and cleared out, which is fine if you're used to that, but it's one of those quick things to uh, trips a couple people up when they first start. The continuous build also works for tests, and we'll get into that when we talk about testing, but most of the time, this is what I'm running. I'll run Gradle T uh, test and just keep running my tests and then switch back and forth, and we'll show that in a little bit. So you've seen the, the kind of high level hello world, but now let's get into these key concepts. Um, Handlers are what's going to do most of your routing and like kicking off all the logic to other parts of the application. So this is where kind of everything comes in. It's a mix between URL mappings and uh, controllers, if you're thinking about from the Grails world. Uh, the context is something we will have a lot of uh, things inside. We'll put uh, objects in there and get them back out. This is where you're actually going to get the request and response from, and then promises. As Rat Pack is all asynchronous and non-blocking, the key is prom promises. So this is an implementation of a handler. You'll notice that in this case, we're actually implementing a real handler and things like that. That's equivalent to us over here in the code actually doing this get render. This is some groovy sugar to make, actually this is creating a handler and wiring it in at a certain point. So handlers don't need to always render something. You can actually have multiple hang handlers cooperate on work together. And you can do this by inserting, you could do a dot next if you've done a little bit of work and you want to move on to the future handlers or you can actually add new handlers into the chain. So what's really interesting there is if you want to inspect the payload and maybe look for API version uh, as a header or something like that, you could then, depending on the API version, insert totally different handler chains with different logic depending on what's going on if you'd like. So you can do all that kind of routing in your handlers. By The reason we do this though is we, then have a really good way to do composition. So you can do your complex routing, versioning, things like that. You could also, uh, depending on how a user authenticates, you may want to have different handlers that loads uh, like a user object in different ways. 
So that's what uh, we do in a couple cases where if we get a JWT token in, we can immediately load the user object from the JWT token into the context and then delegate normally. But if we don't, if we just have an opaque like OAuth token, we need to go look a user up, we can have a handler that basically all it's responsible for is taking a ID and going off and looking that up. And we just insert that into the handler chain and it's something that can be composed then. Now I've sent handler chain a lot. This is the really the what we've seen in Ratpack that Groovy and a few other places. It's if you want to think of it as a chain, it's because we're going to keep processing down and we can add things into that or not, or just keep processing down, but it's always going to go down top to bottom. So the context. This is where basically it's a registry. All of your data is stored inside your context. It allows, you also put all your handlers in, your, in parts of the context and things like that. So when I've talked about adding, inserting handlers, you obviously don't want to make a new handler every time. So you can create a singleton of the handler, put it in your context, and then pull it back out and put, push it in downstream. So to actually work with the context. Oops, wrong button. There we go. Many times you'll see you want to do a single thing in a handler, such as hydrate a person object, so that it can be used down, down the chain. Now what we do in this is we, do, we can import this uh, registry single statically, and then we can add the person, because it's the only object we really want to add, to it and add it next. And now, now downstream from this handler, uh, we have access to the person object. So, whoa, that's there. If we want to add many things uh, to the registry, we can do it uh, with this re registry of and doing registry spec dot add, and you'll notice that we're adding based on a class. So the, everything in the registry and the context that as you pull things out are all class tokens, like type tokens. So you can't just add an arbitrary string. It's not a key value store in the sense that you can't add a string with a certain key name. What you would make is, in this case, if we want a list of people, we're going to make this marker object, which is a person list. That's the actual object that we're inserting it as. And that allows you to strongly type everything. So as you get stuff out, you know exactly the type it is. So if you want to retrieve values, you can do context.get, and you pass in whatever the class is. And you can, the problem with that is that, it's not a problem, but you will get an error if that's not in the registry. It will then throw uh, an exception. Because the expectation is if you're saying, give me that from the registry, if it's not there, you can't do the work that's possible. If you're okay with it potentially not being there, then you use this maybe git option. Maybe git will return an optional of, uh, with the type of whatever you asked for that's present. Most of the time, the uh, context.git, because if, you, if you're not sure if you're like branching on whether or not something is available, it's probably better to branch the handlers and not branch inside, inside of a single handler. Now, to make that easier, if we're using the Groovy DSL that I've showed briefly, uh, we can actually add it as part of the closure right here, and that will immediately pull it in. It's the same as contacts.git. So if it doesn't exist, it's now something that will throw an exception, but it, it's part of the signature, so it, it, it's really nice. It doesn't allow you to do routing, though. So if it's something that isn't, is sometimes there, if you do this syntax, it will expect it to always be there. So in the sense that it's not like you're, you can't really overload the method and say git without any parameters and then a git with person and have those simultaneously. That's not 
So the request and the response. The request and response objects are your basics of inbound and outbound. The request is going to hold all of your headers, the body, query parameters, and cookies. And this is how you actually, if you want to get any of that data, you're going to get it off the request. The interesting part of the request body that you have to realize is that it's a promise. So we, we lazily read the request body. So unless you actually request it, we're never going to read it into memory. It's going to sit down inside of Netty. And how to actually deal with that we'll show when we get to promises, but it's not like text that's readily available. The response is how you actually send data back. It allows you to set cookies, status codes, headers, and whatever your response body is. Eventually, all of your hand, some handler by the end needs to send a response, because otherwise, it doesn't. There will be nothing. The handler will just end. And in the case of development mode in Rat Pack, you'll get an error saying that nothing sent value. This is generally a low-level interface. So if you know exactly what you're sending back, this is a good place to start. We also have the idea of rendering. So rendering is what you're going to use the majority of the time to actually send data back uh, to, a, to the user. And this is, I have a number of links throughout all of these slides. So if you need reference, this is a good place to go to kind of jump deep into the docs. Uh, a note on the documentation is as you look through the documentation, the Java docs for the APIs are actually, actually have a lot of examples built into them. So example code and explanation tends to be more in the actual API docs, not inside of the manual. So the manual is kind of discussing high level things, but you'll get a lot of examples built into the APIs. So if we go and look at that, you'll notice that you get for a Java doc, you get quite a bit of explanation. And then you'll also see a number of code samples and things like that actually in the documentation in the API doc, which is easy to miss. So I wanted to make sure that was there. If you'd like to render JSON back out to the user, there is some built in functionality for that. Uh, out of the box, we support Jackson, and we have a Jackson renderer. you can see that you're able to uh, statically import JSON, and it takes any object and will call the Jackson, the Jackson object mapper to string on it, well, write it out as a value of string from the rendering. So you can do standard annotations and things like that on the actual objects that you're passing in. So in general, Rat Pack's going to expose a number of promises. This is the basic async non-blocking building block that we use everywhere. There is also a concept of an operation, which is effectively a promise which no, with no return value. Uh, you use those sometimes, but the majority of the time, you actually are going to return something. So you're going to be working with promises. Some of the areas that I've seen a number of senior engineers and myself struggle with when you first start is promises don't execute unless they're consumed. So unless you're calling the dot then, which is the thing at the end that actually consumes it, we will never attempt to even execute the promise. And so that's something that is very different from a lot of execu like async executions. Methods on promise that have the word map in them are for transforming the data. They don't actually tr count as consuming the data. So you can chain together a number of transformations, but until you call then, nothing's going to actually execute. And we also use the term activates the promise. And so the then method is what activates the promise. Uh, we can listen to on error, and on error is any any point in this chain of the promise that throws an exception will end up going to this on error that can takes a throwable. So as I said, we would talk about how to actually work with the body. So this is the really verbose way of getting the body text out. And it shows you exactly what's happening. So you have your request, and 
you do get body. We're using Groovy, so that goes down to just body. And that's going to return a promise of type data. Now, once you have the type data is like what we call the body. It has text, it has the bytes, it has um, a few other things to work with. But really, we just want the string of data to work with. So we're going to map this body promise that we have up here. We're going to use the map to actually transform and get the actual text back. At this point, we're going to return the text into the map function. And then the total return is a body string promise. It's a promise of type string. And now we can actually consume it with a then. And at that point, we can render the body text back out. Now that looks very verbose and hard to deal with, but there's a lot of ways to make that much simpler. So that's what's happen actually happening with all the types. You can chain all of that together and easily do the request body map, convert your data, and send that into the renderer with a then. So that, that's, a, that's what you'll see most people uh, working with and doing there. Now, there's one, there's one more um, optimization, which this is now sending. You'll notice that there's no then in this case. So as I said, the promise isn't consumed until there's a then. So what's happening in this case is we're going to send a promise of string into the render method. So render actually has a renderer for promises. And the idea there is that you, it will deal with consuming the promise for you. So instead of always having to do prom the promise dot then render whatever the result is, it deals with doing the, that then for you. So it's a nice little shortcut. So many times in your handlers, you can just render whatever the promise data is. Any questions about promises and execution and things like that? There's a lot more there, and there's an ex there's a asynchronous uh, Rat Pack talk later today that's a lot more in depth that will go into how to work with that much in much more detail. And that's Danny. What time is that? Two. In here. <laughs> so organizing your app. Generally, all your routing shouldn't live in Rat Pack to Groovy, which we've shown so far. All the application logic shouldn't live in ham handlers because we need to break them out somewhere. And related things should generally be grouped together if they work together. So we can, with ratpack.groovy, we can separate routing to related routes, such as we have here. This is a chain that's in ratpack.groovy. You'll notice that we use the prefix to route everything with that slash locations into this locations endpoint. So what we can do is we make an hubs endpoints, this is just what we happen to call it, anything that implements the action chain, is then we're going to pass in a chain to this. Uh, and we, if we do groovy chain, we now get the same DSL as we had in ratpack.groovy inside of this closure at which point it's very easy to compose these things. So in most of our, app, our production applications, our ratpack.groovy sets up three or four different like main routes. Like usually like slash hubs is a good example, slash locations, things like that. And then all of the operations for a hub is then held inside of these endpoints. There's another option, which is you can include additional Groovy script files inside of raptot.groovy. And then you can have your users.groovy like this. There's a few differences from the chain. You'll notice that in ratpack.groovy, there's a binding section. That's where you're going to bind um, services and things like that that we'll talk about shortly. But that's where you're adding all these things to the registry at the beginning, by doing the import, we can actually 
have additional binding blocks. Whereas if you're using the chain, you'll notice that there's no, there's no binding block or anything, it's only that handler chain. But it does merge the chains. So a chain method can, bi can bind to a path that include doesn't, basically. So when you do an include, everything from that is in there. So that's a bad explanation, sorry. Slash users, in this case, it's always going to be slash users. It's always starting from the root. Whereas when we do the, we can use a prefix when we're doing the chain method. So we can say everything at this slash locations, and then when we go into here, we're not specifying slash locations slash ID because all of that's taken care of by the prefix. So if you're doing the rat pack include, there's no prefixing or anything available. So all of that's done. You'll have to do that inside of your included script. Uh, there's a little rat pack include example that has some tests and shows exactly like the different behaviors of how the includes work and things like that. And links to the API doc. So what, what it actually should be in the handler is parsing logic, async calls to your business logic, and calls out to rendering. Now that leaves us with all of our actual business logic. So that's where the, rat pack, the idea of a rat pack service comes along. You can use a rat pack service if you need to be notified of starting and stopping. Uh, if you don't need to know about starting and stopping, and you're not doing anything specific to Rat Pack, you can actually just put all of your business logic into standard uh, classes and not really have any special like Rat Pack functionality if you don't want to. Uh, I tend to, most of my services need to know uh, about ordering because most of my services have dependencies on a database connection or something like that. So that's where service ordering becomes very important. And that's why I tend to have most of my business logic sit, like inside of services. So it makes sure that it doesn't try to start doing work until the DAO layer has started, for example. So I can use the depends on annotation in order to say this class is going to depend on these other services. That, that's really nice if you're doing all of your work inside, uh, like in code that you've written. Now, that becomes a little different when you have, uh, if you have a dependency on something that is not, was not in your code base or may conditionally be in your code base. If, for example, if you're doing a migration service, you may only want to start that, that service after migrations has, start, has started if it's there. So you, that's where you can do things with service dependencies. So if we look at that, we'll see that the service dependencies are actually like a pro programmatic, pro programmatic interface to the dependency chain. So that allows you to m check and see whether or not certain services are there and then very explicitly call out what's going on. Most of the time, depends on, will work within your own application very well. So we can also use juice for a dependency injection into the registry. And a quick example shows us binding if we have some sort of library that we want to expose a service and as we were calling them endpoints, which is a, a chain, we can make sure all of those things are always put. And then we bind just the abstract module in the bindings block. So is there any questions about kind of those concepts before we move on to testing? Yes. Sure. Uh, some of the areas that Rat Pack excels with is if you're doing, if you want to do all async and non-blocking, because 
you've chosen that for performance reasons or because you know you're using. One example is Cassandra. So Cassandra has a really good asynchronous driver. So it's all non-blocking, and if you then use non-blocking in your entire stack, the overall like overhead for your application is very low. Uh, generally, Rat Pack starts in very quickly, as you've seen it start a few times already, and for very small services, it tends to work very well. Uh, there's a lot of personal preference as well. Uh, I find at this point it much easier to compose things in Rat Pack because the handlers are very composable opposed to a controller where you're going to always delegate to a single controller. You can do some of that composition then with libraries and things like that, but it's a little, it's just a different mindset. Yes? Uh, yes, there's, you can, you can do, you can add handlers at the beginning of the chain if you want, um, uh, with some more advanced functionality. The other option is to actually, you could always insert, uh, you can decide to insert more in the chain. So if you don't do a render method and you just, you can always insert more to delegate after. So there is a way to go before. <laughs> So, right, so what you would actually do is if you're thinking about this in like a chain, this is always executes in the top down. We can always do something like this, all, check the recession data right here. And then what will happen is at the end of this, you can do an implicit, you can do a next. Uh, or do nothing and it's fine too. And that just keeps going down. So there's, as long as you're not doing a render or saying that it ends, you will keep going to every handler that matches unless there's a reason that it would end it. So an interesting example in that case is as we're using git here, that expects anything that matches the path to be a git request. If you're to do a post request, and then put an all here. If we go, okay, it's restarted. Let's go ahead and, so if we do a git request at the root, we, we see hello great conf, which is a little small, sorry. But if we do a post, You'll notice we get a client error 405, which basically means method not allowed. Even though we have, in this code, we have another all after, the reason it doesn't go through is Git implicitly says every other method at that path shouldn't work. So if you have anything else as your path, we now get the working message because it's basically going through to here. If you want to, if you want to know, support multiple methods on a single path, we can do that with uh, by method. So now we're seeing post or get back. And now if we do a delete, we're going to get that 405 again because we didn't explicitly call out that method. And the by method handler, so when you see this all by method git, that's actually what's happening under the covers for this git. So this is just the, the DSL syntax to shorten up what you actually have to write. And if there's a lot to do with handlers, and there's a Rat Pack workshop that has 
a lot of hands-on experience doing all of this uh, later today at 4 o'clock. Uh, also, all of that code's available online if you want to dig through. It has lots of examples and tests to work through exactly what's happening. All right. Into testing. So you can use the standard Spock testing. Uh, that's what will come from the lazy boat template. All of that's going to be built out naturally for you. And that gives you what you need to do your testing of a simple uh, Groovy classes. If you want to actually unit test a handler, though, you'll notice a handler expects to be interacted with a certain way. And that's where we have request fixtures. Request fixtures are what's going to set up everything that you need to send in. And what we have here is a request fixture. We're adding what things we want on the registry. So as you know, handlers, as we talked about, get delegated to potentially in a chain. And upstream handlers may be adding certain things to the registry. This, this kind of fixture allows you to add whatever you expect in there and then set headers and bodies of the actual request, at which point you then are going to get back the result of the, of the handler. One important thing to remember, though, is what you get back is not the rendered response. Because the idea is that you're testing a particular handler. It may not be the end handler. So you get back, the if you call render, for example, you actually get back the object that was passed to render, not what would be rendered for a user. So if you want to actually test the rendered output, that's more of a functional test. Which Rat Pack actually has my personal favorite right now, uh, testing kind of feature is the application under test. This allows you to spin up the entire app very quickly uh, and test it directly, but it also gives you the ability to override just certain parts of the running app. So if we dig into this example, what I like to do is I extend the application under test now, you'll notice this really long class name over here, the Groovy Rat Pack main application under test. If you're <laughs> everything in Rat Pack is actually built to, you can write it with Java if you'd like, and then there's a lot of syntactic sugar to make things work in Groovy as you like it. If you're doing this ratpack.groovy style that I've been showing, you just have to use this particular Groovy Rat Pack main application under test because what happens is under the covers, it's going to generate a main, a main uh, an application that has a Java main and actually runs it. So I extend that, and I can now add what we call impositions. So we had a number of things in the registry, and I will actually override them completely for the application here. So in my case, I'm overriding a token validator. So that's what we're using for security. It checks for a bearer token. and the no op token validator is in, there's an open source project called the bear, Rat Pack Bearer Auth. Uh, this is exposed there in the testing. And basically, if you get fake token in, it lets it through. If you get bad token in, it doesn't let it through. And so you can kind of programmatically control what's going in. What ties the application that's running together is the test client. So the, the test HTTP client meant to be used in your actual tests, you're able to actually configure. So you'll see that I'm setting it up so that every request will have a, a correct bearer token by default. You can then override your default in your testing. Almost all of the functionality that gets like in the actual tests very easily. So now that you have this application under test, we can actually use it. By setting up in Spock a delegate to the test HTTP client, it makes it a very easy syntax. All of the gits and things like that then start just working in your tests, and because that's going to make a git request out to your currently running application. Your currently running application will, will be spun up on a random port and things like that. So all of that 
logic it, of setting up your test client correctly is encapsulated in the application under test. But this is a complete Spock test right here that tests the actual output. And then if we go into the example, the Rat Pack site actually uses these smoke tests to check that the site actually comes up and works. But this is the entire uh, application test and there's the manual, the main site, and index. That's our three major components and you're very, this is a very nice way to run right after you do a deploy and things like that. You'll notice that we have the delegate set up and the special thing here is this right rat pack site under test is the similar to when we're making this example application under test class. Almost all of our classes and all of our microservices now create this application under test extension. You can also very easily do uh, functional testing with Jeb if you'd like. And to do that, uh, you're going to have a little more setup. So you take your application under test, you get the address out of it, and you basically just set that to your base URL on the browser. So if we look at the example, as long as you use a Jeb reporting spec, the only thing you have to really set up is this, this line 22, uh, sorry, 32. At, that, at which point you can use all your standard Jeb testing. Everything with our fat jars uh, works based on the shadow jar. So what we can do is, it's very easy to do. You set up your shadow jar. Your shadow jar is going to give you a fat jar. The fat jar is your actual deployable thing. Uh, it's runnable now with java-jar. So it ends up in build libs dash all. Everything will just boot and run. At which, so if you wanted to actually deploy this, it's very simple to add, to write an upstart that script that then does the Java jar. And that's similar to how most people are deploying most application frameworks at this point. Most people are no longer doing wars and things like that, especially if you're doing microservices. If you want to add this into Docker, this is a one line thing now. The front with the fat jar is everyone, ah, far jar instead of fat jar, great. Uh, typo. Run shadow will run your application as the fat jar. The reason that becomes important is if you're doing class path, if you've ever done or are doing class path work, it always is different in your jar versus running inside of Gradle. So if you do Gradle run shadow, it actually forks the process and you can, you can debug those kind of issues much more quickly and easily. So that's all I have prepared. I've got five minutes for questions, it looks like. And if there's no questions, I'll live code. <laughs> Correct. Because this is a test HTTP client, this is a blocking implementation. So the test HTTP client is actually built on top of the rat pack HTTP client, but it does everything in blocking. Because if you're in your tests, most of the time you're not testing, you don't want asynchronous testing. If you're testing asynchronous things, there's something called the exec harness, which I thought it, I don't, yeah, uh, no. So the exec harness, I don't have a link to it, but the exec harness allows you to have a closure, put your promises in there, and then call yield, and then yield will actually do the, the blocking for you in your test, and then you get your, your data back out. Yes? Yes? 
Uh, not with Rat Pack. So at this, Rat Pack is slim enough that unless you're dragging in a ton of uh, external libraries by its like nothing is going to make it super big by the fat jar. Uh, in general, every, all these mi the microservices that we deploy in production and things like that, the fat jars are are small. They're a good size. We're also using either containers. That we want one artifact to be. Uh, I was actually deploying. We deploy a Grails three app as well, and we use fat jars for that deploy as well. So that's awesome. I've I've never tuned that low. I so. With, given Rat Pack, you want to have two cores. So because you, you want to have two cores because there's a compute thread and an I.O. thread. And because of that, the smallest instance on Amazon, because we use AWS, is of a size that we've never run, like a, the smallest one that doesn't have CPU credits, because that also scares me, because CPU throttling on my production applications is hard for me to deal with. Uh, given those things, we actually have never hit a like that's big enough for us. We tend to actually have a little extra room on the box and we use a lot of in-memory um, database, uh, sorry, in-memory caches. So by using the in-memory caches, we tend to make our heap size a little bigger uh, because we use some of the on, on heap uh, in-memory caches. By default Java settings, you will like, you'll be fine. You won't have a major problem. You just won't be utilizing your box to its fullest. So I would tend to tune the heap sizes and everything up a little bit. If you're using containers or something like that and able to tune down, uh, I think it's usually you're going to have enough things for memory uh, that I'd say 250 to 500 megs will be fine. I just don't think I would. I personally wouldn't run them that small just because that's not how we, because we tend to use a lot of, local caching and things like that. It's not because of overhead from the framework, but the way we design our applications just happens to use more memory. Other questions? So I've got two minutes that we can attempt, should be easy, to, so I have an application running, uh, well written, and then it's going to run on 5050. So what I'd like to do is show you how to actually make an HTTP client call. That's not the right client. There we go. No. So if we call HTTP client, we're going to inject that into our handler from the context. If we get localhost, so that's returning a promise. If we then so that's going to re what this actually returns is a received response. Just so I don't type it wrong, we're gonna go. Okay. So if we run that, now if we do a request to There we go. Oh, what do we do? Oh, so we're calling 5051. The problem is this, actually, because I was, forgot that was in there. There we go. So now if we, oh, I was doing delete, too. All right. 
So Yeah, I'm running two apps right now. So Oh, it's URI. Thank you. This is why you don't do live coding. There. So now that we pass the URI in, that's rebooted. We can make the request. You notice 200 uh, response. If we go in and kill, so this is the one that's running the 50, uh, 51. If we kill that one, we should now stop getting a 200. Potentially. Let's make sure that. Okay, so that doesn't get. There we go. Connection refused now. Actually, it's probably the REST client is. Sorry, the the browser client I was using instead of curl because I always screw up curl uh, does have caching. So thanks. So now we'll see the actual exception, and you'll notice that we're getting an exception from there. So if we go. We can run it again. Now we're out of time. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. Uh, if you have more interest, more questions, you can ask me on Twitter anytime. There's the async deep dive uh, today at 2, and then at 4, there's the Rat Pack workshop. Thank you very much. <laughs>